This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Welcome to our Rejoice worship service from Church Street United Methodist Church on this, the second Sunday of Easter. join me in our call to worship from Psalm 16. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life in your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Yeah. 
Will you join me in our prayer for illumination? O oh God, open our hearts to the words of Scripture that we are about to read. By the grace of the Holy Spirit, help us to hear the good news of our resurrected Lord. In studying your word, may we draw closer to your kingdom and trust more fully in the good news of Easter. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. Hear now the word of the Lord. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Understanding the Gospel of John requires the hearer, if not already familiar with the ways of sheep, to be willing to learn about sheep. Jesus makes pronouncements and now commandments. They're all connected to the agrarian image of sheep. In chapter 10 of John, Jesus describes his relationship with Israel and even those beyond the assumed fold of his care in Israel as his sheep. It is in John that Jesus declares that he is the good shepherd and the gate into the sheepfold. Catherine reminded us last week of the importance of what Jesus said before his death. Though she was reading from Matthew's Gospel, and the words as such do not appear in John's, the commitment that Jesus has revealed to his disciples that all they need to understand the resurrection is just as pivotal in John's lessons. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. It is this good shepherd that talks to Peter on the shoreline after breakfast with the other disciples. Peter is such a fascinating figure for Christians to emulate. He's always making these grand gestures and over-the-top statements. During the Last Supper, as Jesus is going around washing the feet of the disciples, 
Peter initially refuses, saying he's not worthy. Jesus responds by telling Peter that it isn't really an option if he, Peter, wants to be a disciple. Once again, Peter goes all in and says, okay, wash not, not just my feet then, but my head and my hands. Whenever I read a story with Peter in it, in all four of the Gospels, I tend to editorialize a nice eye roll from Jesus into the picture in my mind. I always wonder if one of the other disciples, like the grounded and practical Thomas, mutters, slow your roll, Peter, under his breath. In defense of Peter, I love a good rhetorical flourish, a grand statement here and there for effect. It is clear that Peter wants to be someone who is all in or all out. He is the one that stands up and declares that he won't abandon Jesus and that he would lay down his life for Jesus. And in fact, it is Jesus who lays down his life for his friends. You are likely familiar with the story that Peter, in fact, as Jesus said he would, denied Jesus after his arrest. And now, the resurrected Jesus speaks face to face with Peter. Just as Peter denied Jesus in a threefold pattern, so now does Jesus ask him in a pattern of three if Peter loves him. It is here in this exchange about loving Jesus that I think we discover the heart of the shared call of all disciples. Jesus, the good shepherd, the one who has promised to seek and care for the sheep, couples the love of his disciples to the work of caring for the sheep. Jesus is not satisfied with, yes, you know that I love you. Jesus pressed the point so far with Peter that we are told that Peter is actually hurt by the repeated questioning. Now, many good sermons have focused upon the repeated questioning of Peter's love for Jesus. But I'd like for us to focus on the commandment that Jesus gives, coupling love and care for the sheep, love for Jesus and care for the sheep. My social media ads are dominated by companies trying to sell me bikes and bike gear on one hand <clears throat> and theological and religious articles and content on the other. I find that the religious content seems to be dominated by stuff from a reformed evangelical tradition. I came across one article critiquing Christians who fall prey to calls for social justice, a desire for pure doctrine, unfettered by cultural concerns, seemed to be the driving force behind such a concern in the article. But solid doctrine, I believe, insists that God's kingdom has come near, and we are not left unchanged by it if we are disciples. As I've said on multiple occasions, I believe that the traditional doctrines of the church matter. I'm annoyed when some in our Methodist uh, community attempt to use the word orthodox in a way that attempts to shut down discussion and debate around issues and ideas. Orthodoxy pertains to the beliefs and understandings of the person of Jesus Christ and the triune Godhead. Orthodoxy, for over 1,500 years, has indicated an agreement with and an ability to confess the creeds of the church. Though our culture has also misused and politicized the word evangelical, the classic definition of that word is one that I'm loath to abandon. I believe we are called to share the good news of Jesus with the world. My understanding of what it means to be orthodox and evangelical, I think, is found here in Jesus' questioning and command to Peter. Next Saturday, within Holston Conference, there will be a called annual conference where those churches and pastors who no longer believe they can remain in fellowship with the United Methodist Church will seek approval to leave the denomination. My heart, my heart is heavy as I see brothers and sisters, folks who have strengthened and enriched my own faith, will leave. Yet our commandment has not changed. I'm sad, but like Peter, Jesus invites me to push through my hurt and sadness to fulfill the commandment to which I am called, which means loving not only the sheep who remain, but all of the sheep. In the weeks following the tragic shooting at a school in a church building, 
in our own state, I have been confounded as a faith leader on how to process and how to proceed. I take seriously my call to shepherd and to lead, but any word that I might offer from a prayer, a post that I could share on social media, or a statement of my own personal beliefs of what we might be able to do to protect our children seems loaded with potential to alienate or anger. This is a bewildering predicament for someone like me who feels called to navigate differences, to build consensus, and to bridge division with the gospel. Jesus' commandment does not come to us in spite of our ecclesial and cultural challenges, but in the midst of them. What fills me with joy that exceeds any frustration or sorrow is the life of discipleship itself. When I feel Christ asking me, challenging me, do you love me? I am reminded that Christ has first loved me. Easter moves us from fear to love. Also in last week's Easter sermon, Catherine reminded us of the power of Jesus' proclamation to not be afraid. It is love that casts out fear. It is love that can find a way when there is no way. The Methodist movement was founded upon an emphasis of God's love as transformative and as one that is to be lived out. The articles that keep filling up my social media feed sometimes seem unaware that there has long been traditions within Christianity that emphasize what we now call justice issues. It was various Christian churches, groups, and individuals that led the abolitionist movement, the civil rights movement, the women right, women's rights movement, the movement to end child labor, and the implementation of public education. Much of what prevents any of us from making a change is the fear that what we will get could be worse than what we already have. And it is healthy to have a little fear. Being a little nervous about heights can be a useful instinct when needing to climb on a roof or climbing a ladder with power tools. But unchecked fear can lead to all sorts of negative outcomes. Our physical health can suffer and our social and emotional well-being can be harmed. Central to the gospel is the belief that God's love is what can and will overcome fear. It's our call to love and care for one another that helps us understand and interpret scripture, discern what decisions we should make and how to live in community together. Peter, always making these grand statements and gestures, finds himself sitting on the beach, seemingly alone with Jesus. Peter is shown grace and mercy by Jesus for denying Jesus. Jesus doesn't hold an inquest as to de determine Peter's exact feelings at the time of the denial. Jesus knows that Peter was afraid. Imagine if the resurrected Jesus went around punishing all those who had been afraid during the resurrection, or during the crucifixion before the resurrection. Instead, Jesus goes around encouraging, empowering his disciples to love. Love is not cheap, however. Love is not easy or without sacrifices. Love demands so much from us, and when we truly are affected by love, we will not be unchanged by this encounter with God's love. On Palm Sunday after worship, I left straight from the church and drove to my hometown in Northeast Ohio. One of the important adults from my childhood had died the Thursday before. I take my commitment to my work very seriously, and to be honest, it was difficult for me to imagine leaving town during the first half of Holy Week on personal business. It was made even more challenging for me because the family had added, had asked me to speak and lead the funeral. One of the thoughts I shared in my sermon at the funeral, a thought formed by this caring woman's ceaseless commitment to all those she loved, was that love is not like withdrawing money from a bank. When I take money from my bank account, it's gone. And the only way to get more is to get it from somewhere else. No, instead, love is like planting seeds. I have this dream of planting acorns 
in my backyard and letting oak trees fill in the large open space. If I have three acorns and I plant them, it would seem that my acorns are gone. But more acorns may, may in fact come. If I care for and tend the trees, they will grow. Now I will never see them fully grown. That's not how oak trees work. My own children won't be able to climb them, but they will grow. More acorns will come and their shade will stretch across the large open space. And maybe someday children can climb in those trees. Jesus has loved his disciples and has planted within them the, the call to love and serve others as an act of love and serving God. Where we are being called, where are we being called? To love and tend for the lambs and the sheep that Christ is calling to himself. When we think about the violence in our world, how might our response be transformed by thinking about Jesus' command to tend his sheep? What is our responsibility to those around us? What does Christ's love compel us to do and say in moments of suffering and strife? When we have real and substantial disagreements in the church, and we do, what does it look like to care and tend for those with whom we disagree? Peter's transformation is not complete on the beach. God's love continues to shape and challenge each of us as it grows within us. In the book of Acts, we will see Peter continue to grow and be challenged by his love for Jesus. Peter will have to give up thoughts and feelings that he holds dear in order to fulfill Jesus's command. He discovers that some of the lambs to which Jesus referred were in fact Gentile lambs. They were lambs far away in Rome, and they were lambs that did not always understand what he was trying to teach them. As we continue to grow in our calling as Easter people, may we take seriously the good news that Jesus loves us, full stop. I cannot control how others feel about me, but I can listen to the Spirit as I am guided to love others. We are called to share in the ministry of Peter, caring for the sheep that Jesus places in our midst, and then trusting that God will guide us in how to love and protect them. This week, may God help us claim as our own the work of nurturing and caring for Christ's sheep. Amen. As we gather in prayer after each intercession, I will say, Lord, with the confidence of resurrection, and I invite you to respond, we are not afraid. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Lord, we praise and glorify you as we celebrate your defeat of all the forces of sin and death. We join our hearts and voices together in singing hymns and in shouts of joy and celebration, singing and proclaiming Christ the, our Lord is risen today. We praise you because we are so aware of the power of death. Creation groans under the weight of all those powers and principalities that seek to undo, to destroy, and to steal our hope. In our Lytton journey, we have known and named such pain and loss. In the light of this Easter season, we find hope in the face of grief and loss. Fill us with an Easter hope that will stay with us through the year of head. Lord, with the confidence of resurrection, we are not afraid. God, you who breathed life into all creation, breathe upon creation new life today. We see in our midst symbols and signs of your sustaining grace. We see the trees turning green again. Colors and hues give beauty to the landscape that for many months has seemed bleak and dull. We praise you for the beauty of creation for the bounty of your resources and our calling to care and tend for the earth. 
where we have used our resources unwisely or with selfish intent, forgive us. When nature has caused damage to the homes and communities of others, move us to action. When we have abused and neglected that to which we are charged to care for and steward, by your mercy guide us to change. Let us discover in your resurrection the strength to work towards a creation in harmony with itself. May we strive to embrace and embody a creation that fully reflects your peaceable kingdom. Lord, with the confidence of resurrection, we are not afraid. Lord Jesus Christ, in your triumph over the cross, you show yourself to be greater than all the powers of this world. Rulers and kings sought to destroy you through violence and death, and yet you overcame the violence of the cross and the darkness of the tomb. When we are lured by the powers of this world, remind us of your strength, your grace, and most of all, your loving mercy. Our hearts are so often filled with division and anger towards the other, the other that votes differently than us, the other that lives differently than us, other that speaks and acts differently than us. As Tennesseans, our hearts are heavy. We need this Easter proclamation as much as ever. We pray for our leaders, those we voted for and those we did not. We pray for those who work to keep our families, our schools, our children, and all in our communities safe. When fear moves us to use our power in harmful ways, correct and guide us in your spirit. May we trust not in our power, but in yours. Lord, with the confidence of resurrection, we are not afraid. Lord of the living and the dead, we pray for those who we love but rest in you. Even as we celebrate the resurrection, comfort us when we mourn. Remind us that since Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, so too will all those whom you call forth on that great getting up morning, may we be raised to new life. As we long for that day, grant to each of us the assurance that living and dying, our life is in you. We are afraid to die, but help us that in the promise of resurrection, we would not be afraid to live boldly for you. Lord, with the confidence of resurrection, we are not afraid. And now, because we can be confident in the resurrection, we offer these prayers to you in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As Easter people who do in fact love Jesus, let us go forth into this world to care for his sheep. Amen. <laughs>